Good morning everyone, welcome to First Chapter Fun. This is episode three, three or three. Um, today I'm going to be reading from Rosnay's excellent, excellent second novel, Hurry Home. Hi Ros. I've changed the setup a little bit because um, my webcam was doing weird stuff. So now I'm actually recording this on my iPhone. So that's why the background is different. And, you know, you get to see all my wrinkles. That's lovely. So um, enjoy that bit. So in any case, Roz. Roz is a fellow Canadian, uh, but also a fellow Brit. Hi, Roz. She's out in BC. And uh, her first novel, Our Little Secret... There we go. Won awards, has been translated into various languages, um, was picked as a Kobo pick of the year or um, something like that. Sorry, Roz, you can correct me. And she's going to be with us today. Natalie says hello. Hi, Natalie. Lovely that you're here. So Roz will be here um, and you can as with all of these videos, I'm going to save them and you can leave questions for the authors and they're going to respond to them as and when. So, hurry home. Another domestic suspense. Where's Roz? There she is. There we go. So, I'm going to read um, the prologue and part of the first chapter. I'm going to try and keep these videos under 15 minutes. So I can actually um, make sure that they get onto IGTV. Roz is here. Hey, Roz. And Nancy is here too, saying she's ready for her story. Wonderful. Okay. So to make sure I keep this under 15 minutes and get it on IGTV as well, that's Instagram TV, I'm going to start reading. I hope you're all well. And uh, let's see where this chapter le leads us. <clears throat> so this is... Prologue and chapter one of Hurry Home. And there we go. Lovely cover, huh? Covers, even. By the amazing, wonderful Rosnay. Here we go. The woman holds the baby close and ghost dances by the window. She can see her reflection in the glass. She doesn't mind being awake with her little boy at this odd, witchy hour when everyone else is, is asleep. This moment is a secret that only they share. He is olive-skinned, familiar, although a far cry from her own pale colouring. It doesn't matter, she thinks. He's mine and I'm keeping him. Outside, the street is quiet. The mountains in the distance watch over the sleeping town. She concentrates on the cowrie shell curl of his hand. His fingernails are tiny and perfect, little crescent moons in each one. Did she make those? In one of his hands is a worn old clothespin that he's been gripping for days. A dog's bark pierces the silence and the baby startles and throws out his arms. How powerful babies are, she thinks, how vulnerable. She lifts her shirt and juggles him until he finds her breast. They fit perfectly together. They're made for each other. A few moments later, the baby unlatches, frustrated, and she prods at his lips, her brow darkening. I'm sorry, she says to him. Shh. He doesn't even try to latch again. Instead, he fusses and turns his head away. Hey, she says, her voice louder. It's just us now. You'll never see her again. The baby blinks, working up to a cry, and they stare at each other for a second, old souls reconnected like there was never any loss before, and nothing ever went wrong. You're okay, little one. You're safe now. There, that's better. In a minute, she'll fetch him formula from the fridge, warm it up, test the temperature of it against the tender flesh of her inner arm. She knows how to do all of this. She's a natural. Finally, everything is exactly as it should be. Act One. The Garda. Alexandra. In the dream, I am running and my sister is behind me. The ground is brittle, hard against my summer feet. And, as with every dream, I think I'm rushing to save something, to stop it. But it's not that. It's so much worse. I can hear Ruth gaining on me. She's bigger than me. And she grazes the back of my shirt with her fingertips as I strain to run faster. When she finally grabs me, as she always does, 
She pulls me down into the dust and her sharp fingernails dig into the little girl flesh of my arms. It's just a game, I scream. We're only playing. And I jolt upright in bed, my feet pedalling at the sheets, my tongue pasted against the soil of my mouth. I lie, panting for a minute. I thought the dreams would lessen, but they're getting worse. They're always of her, or the version of her I last saw all those years ago. It's crazy to be so afraid of her. I don't even know where she is. I tiptoe out of bed, careful not to wake up Chase, and stumble to the kitchen to get water, to put out this fire in my head. I'm so thirsty all the time. By the sink, I run cold, clear water and drink from the tap, splashing a little to my forehead. Chase's loft is high-ceilinged and open concept, a one-bedroom that's short on doors and boundaries. Some couples might find that claustrophobic, but I don't. I find it companionable. I can just see him from where I stand by the sink. He's a muscular guy, but he breathes so softly, his tanned arm lolling against the crisp white sheets. I've no concept of where he goes when he sleeps, but it's an opposite dreamscape to mine. Outside, the sky is trying for an early blue. It's June, but there's still a 7am grey that leaks slowly into colour. In this Colorado town, we're never too far from the creep of the glacier, a silent advance I can't help but find sinister. Chase, though, he loves everything about the mountains. On my way to the walk-in closet, I trail a fingertip across the tall canvas print of him by the front door, a professional mountain shot of his body upside down, hucking a 20-foot drop on skis. I could never do that. Wouldn't even know where to begin. But he's good in environments that I'd find daunting. He rarely ponders such things as his own mortality. Behind him, snow wisps delicately to eclipse the sun. I have to admit, it's a beautiful photo. Once I've pulled on skinny jeans and a t-shirt that isn't too crumpled, I grapple my hair into a top knot and grab my khaki jacket and my old leather satchel. I lift the satchel over my head so the strap lies diagonal across the front of me. My vans are by the front door and I kick my feet into them, wondering if at 25 it might be time to buy shoes that aren't best suited to the average 14-year-old boy. But my job doesn't require a corporate dress code. As a child protection social worker, it's best if I look relatable. Tucked away in the Rocky Mountains, Moses River is isolated in the winter months, but now the trees along the sidewalk are in bloom, the buds bulging with optimism. Locals mill about on Main Street, coffee in tall travel cups as they lean against their parked trucks. Wheels of mountain bikes hook over every, every tailgate. If there's bustle, it isn't work-related. Life is beautiful, reads more than one bumper sticker, but ask any social worker in this town and they'll tell you life around here is a lot of things, not all of them beautiful. But we're trying. We're trying for the kids who don't believe the bumper stickers, for the kids who live the truth. As I walk up Main, I think about Minerva's email from last night. It was hassled and hurried as usual, but she told me there was a report of negligence involving a little boy and his parents, a couple called the Floyds. I haven't heard the name before, but from the tone of the email, it seemed like she was familiar with them. If she wants me on board, the case must be an ugly one. It always is when there's a baby involved, a little baby boy. Minerva Cummins used to work in Mel Minerva Cummins used to work in mental health and addictions before she crossed over to family services, and she's never shaken it off. Every exchange I have with her feels like she's trying to help me out of some kind of saddening entrenchment. Even as I'm solving problems, she'll still sigh with her eyes closed as if I'm the cause of them. Sometimes I wonder if that's why her husband divorced her. My boss, Morris, rarely puts me and Minerva together on cases, perhaps because he knows that as one of the older, more experienced social workers on the team, she can be patronising. She's a mother, Alex, Morris told me once in his office, but don't let her mother you. An unexpected cold blast of air hits me as I round the corner onto Cedar Street, and I jog up the next few steps to the Lovin' Oven Bakery. 
The bell above the robin egg blue door jingles as I enter and I'm greeted by the smell of butter tarts. The bakery is compact with a long counter, various chalkboards on brick with the handwritten names of soups, rows of golden fresh bread stacked on shelves behind the till and three rough wooden tables for eating at, all of them rectangular with benches. I do a quick scan of the room as I enter. Minerva's not here yet. For all the dedication she claims to have, it's rare that she arrives on time to anything. Once I've bought a coffee, I find a seat at the far end of the long table and wait for her. Over in the corner, two old ladies in matching knitted hats share a pot of tea. For a second, I wonder if they're sisters. The thought stops my breath. But then the bell opens, the, but then the bell above the door jingles and Minerva strides toward me, corduroy pants chafing noisily as she moves. Her brown bob is still wet from the shower. It looks plastic, like hair you press onto Lego people. She stops in front of me at the opposite bench. Another day, another dollar. Morning, I say. Are you ready to go? I half stand. Chilly boots. I need to brief you first. And you know I can't do anything without a strong coffee. Coffee is why she wanted to meet early. I reluctantly sit back down while Minerva orders her coffee, then settles into a seat as though we have all the time in the world all the time in the world when a young child's well-being is at stake. So, I say, careful to hide my impatience, tell me about this baby boy and his parents. Frank and Evelyn Lo Floyd have a history of drugs and alcohol addiction, she takes a wary sip of her first drinks. Basically, they were druggies, troublemakers before they had a child, but they've been better since he was born. Okay, so then why are we both going on this visit, I ask. What I really want to say is get a move on. The baby's name is Buster, she says, dodging my question. She pauses, relishing the Floyd's baby's name, hoping I'll laugh at it, but I don't. Earlier this week, they left him outside in the car while they went into the post office. Some good Samaritan called it in. We'll go out to their house, have a quick peekaboo, and that'll be it. We'll be in and out, brass sprout. Her phrasing catches me off guard. In and out so fast when they left a baby abandoned in a car. How long was he alone for? Come on, Alex, you know the drill, she says, shaking her head. You can't assume the kid is in danger just because some stranger said so. I need you there with me to fairly assess things. And we need proof of abuse or neglect. Abuse or neglect. Suddenly I can't touch my latte. How old is Buster? Oh, a year at the most, I think. Minerva looks at me quizzically. Are you okay? No, Minerva, I'm not okay, I want to say. As many cases as we resolve in child protection, kids living in horrible circumstances who we rescue and give a chance at a better life, new cases pop up at double the rate. I feel like Mickey Mouse in that old cartoon, the one we had to watch as, Christmas, as kids at Christmas. Mickey's in his workshop and it's flooding and the mops are out of control and yet no matter how hard he tries, the water keeps pouring in, backing Mickey up the stairs. I hated that cartoon the first time I saw it, but it was always Ruth's favourite. Can we get going? I stand up. Oh, all right then, she says, exhaling. Although it wouldn't hurt to relax a vu for a minute. You'll be on stress leave in no time, just like everyone else. If you, try, if you keep trying to save the world, I ignore her and head for the door. That was part of Rosnay's wonderful upcoming novel, Hurry Home. Here it is. It publishes on July the 7th. So if you can't wait that long, you're going to have to read this one, aren't you? Ros's Our Little Secret, which is absolutely brilliant. I love Roz, I love your books, and Roz is here. Hey, Roz! Oh, and Robin's here too, fantastic. So, don't forget, you can leave questions and comments for Roz, and she'll get round to them and answer them uh, as we go along. So, that was First Chapter Fun today. Tomorrow's lineup, we have Stranger in the Lake by Kimberly Bell. That will be at 11.30 a.m. ET. So I'm going to post this video, I'll post it on Instagram. If you could share this far and wide, you know, because everyone wants to see my lovely wrinkly face, 
Um, that would be great so we get more viewers and more people. And please um, remember to uh, check out Ros's book. There it is again. Here we are. And uh, I will see you tomorrow. In the meantime, stay safe, stay kind, and I'll see you tomorrow.